So Doris is, is one of the most eminent poets from Estonia, and she's widely translated. And a lot of her work is in sets of music, um, which comes up in her work a lot because her, her, her father, Hilar, was a composer, and she's in dialogue with him through, through a lot of the poems. Um, and that's something that she shares with Tom, how they sort of enter into dialogue with, with the dead um, and with the present as well. Um, and she has a wonderful essay, or a sort of micro-essay at the end of her selected, um, which sort of touches on her father being a master of harmony. And I think, and, and the paradox is contained in that, 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 that the chaos and harmony as well. Um, the thing I loved about Doris's collection is that you can just lift, lift them like aphorisms or epigraphs. Every line is so sort of taut and um, concentrated. Um, and um, her work is really preoccupied with grace a lot. Um, and that's maybe something that we could talk about afterwards with Thomas as well. Um, and Death, I, I guess if it's okay to say these thoughts are very fluent in death um, and the rituals and the routines and also the humour that goes with death. Um, I think we've all stifled the giggle at, at a funeral and, and you know, we all know the humour of death. Um, and, and Thomas is from Detroit and he um, comes from a unique background and he's handled death in a way that most of us haven't. Um, with his actual hands. Um, he's, he's worked as a funeral director and he's privy to a part of death that a lot of us are protected from. Um, in a 2000, um, I guess it was, a, it was a piece on you, uh, but also included some quotes and interviews in the New York Times. And you were saying how your job was like to, to minister people and something of being like a sin eater, which is something that comes from our own heritage or Celtic or Celtic kind of culture. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, they're both award-winning poets um, and, and massively published in, in very prestigious journals. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you both and, and discussing maybe some of those themes I mentioned after. So thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm very happy and grateful to be here, and uh, particularly today, which is uh, World Poetry Day. Congratulations to everybody. <laughs> and uh, I will read uh, some poems in Estonian because I love the language and uh, translations by Miriam McEpatrick Xenophoto. I'm happy to say that uh, a few days ago she received the highest uh, prize of translation for this collection. If I do not speak of this, I will die. If I reveal it, it will kill me. What on earth do I do? Kui kirjutan, Karjatan sõna kuulmatuid sõnu peaaegu võimatul nõrval, vaikuse kuru kõrval. Kui kirjutan, harjutan varjude valitsemist, jahedan randmel, rapiiril, viimse pimeda piiril. Kui kirjutan, kirjutan päriselt keeldumus keeles. Mu ülim pilgar on paast, taevast 
part of this mast. When I write, I shepherd unheeding words on the nigh impossible slope of the paths of silence. When I write, I practice mastery of shadows with cool wrist and repair on the verge of final darkness. When I write, I write an utterly forbidding language. My ultimate feast is to fast, the very unearthing of heaven. Kaata ja kiituseks laula, sest võitjale laulatakse niigi, kurva ees kummardan, löödu ees langetan pea. Maailmast loobu ja loob leia punede senese riigi. Tõelus, et alu ja sala jõudu ja suurus keegi ei tea. Kaata ja kiituseks loola ja ilma oli ka iluks. Põlatu pärga, ta kõrvele laubale vajutan suu. Sellele, kes suudab selgust puuduvast kogu eluks. Kerke ja sirgena kanda, olen ma tuumani truu. I sing in praise of the loser, for the winner is well loaded. I kneel before the forlorn. I bow before the beaten. The world quitter creates, discovers selfdom in dreams. The reality bearer holds strength and stature untold. I sing in praise of the loser. And for the Hamlet's joy, I crown the outcast, pressing my lips to that noble brow, to the one who labours lifelong with the lack and loss, both lightly and upright. I am true to the core. Nothing else have I asked, nor will I. A clear heart is my only request. The will to mirror the sky in response to the refracting world. Give me moments of light in blood, in spirit, so that I may find my way. Give my soul grace to bestow mercy. Give me fortitude to remain fair. Nothing is happening. Just stars circling and worlds forming, falling, flickering by the second. Their tremorous dust, light laden on my eyelids. I sense like a far off whiff of childhood when I simply knew, yes, it will happen. God, God, nothing is happening. From here root to foot soul, a lightning strike pierces, and you spin, speechless, in cosmic solitude, in eternal inquiry, amid hollowness and wholeness, boundless being. Whisper sighs, shrill cries, snippets of rambling, you seem to hear in the oddly distant din of the universe. Shadows, shimmies, traces of things fancied, things faced. Though nothing is happening. Even your inmost magic molten fire, fluid trickling 
word magma refuses to harden into a song-like lie. Nothing is happening. Just stars circling. The heart, saline and crystalline, throbs alone, ticks true. World, let me off. World, yes, I'm through. Nothing is happening. Just stars circling in cosmic solitude, in eternal inquiry, amid hollowness and wholeness. Boundless being. I dreamt about the world. Out of its mind, it sought to surround me, to overlap the shores of my imagination. No, I whispered. No. I seek something else. I seek the unexpected, infinite as the universe, a new, invigorating, molten essence. World. O oh, world, be more, I beg. Thus it was born. The answer I asked for shattered me. The light blinded me. A blast from the bedrock of the world severed my hopes layer by layer and scorching, it altered me beyond recognition. God forsaken, trembling and naked, I will to a rain of stars. In shy, in shy desire, I stretched out my hand and I laughed out loud, grasping the dream I had about the world. A dream about love. A dream. Ma magasin mineraalide und, ma magasin nagu magma ja nägin nägemust. Heikkiv tuul tõusis vähvata mägede taga. Päevad sulasid kokku ainsaks pisaraks, kurgust kertis vaid kiituse laul. Igimängle kärk leekristall, mu muutlikus kujus, kujus. I slept the sleep of minerals, I slept like magma, and I had a vision. A shimmering wind rose menacing beyond the mountains. Days all melted to a single tear. A song of praise rose from my throat. A lively, scintillating fire crystal. A swim in my shifting shape. Mail mononab, mondo be voolab. Kõik, mis koguneb, koondab ja kaob. Peres rändamas tähtade soola. Mälus purpurusa kusina tao. Ära otsu. Su olek on olnud. Ära karda. Kõik kordumas pääs. Mida päriselt kunagi polnud, on ainus, mis aloti käes. The world slips the mind. Mutates and melts. All that collects, clusters, 
recoils. Roaming in the blood is star sword, mounting in memory a purple pulse. Do not believe it. Your being has been. Do not worry, it recurs in the head. What truly never has been is only and always at hand. Dauntless, defenseless, the word of truth dazzles in the light of dawn like a mountain lake, like deepest desire, limpid, vivid and lucid. Surreal and clear is its diamond colour. A stairway, a sky snail shell, on wings, step by step, year by year, its wake fading. Only weariness grows and bestows heavy, red and rampant blooms, sometimes even fruit. A rain of spores and sparks. Words gush from eyes and ears. Breath. Silence. Breath. The blinding glare of emptiness. The sky snail shell and winds into lingering luminance, into original formlessness. One more step. Then the mind within will see the mind without. Lumi on puhas lehit. Selle all hõõguvad salakirjad. Kevade trompeti soolu ja suvel safrani värv. Lumi on puhas lehet. Ära kirjuta sinna ühtegi nime. Las tähed peegelduvad ta arvututes kristalles. Iga helles on täht. Ühte aegu kordumatu ja tähtsusõttu. Kõik suvad. Lumi on puhas lehet ja lootus. Keele vaikus ja määratu tähendus. Snow is a blank sheet. Underneath ciphers glow on sea. The trumpet solo of spring. The saffron shade of summer. Snow is a blank sheet. Do not write there a single name. Let stars be reflected in countless crystals. Each flake is a star, altogether unique in insignificance, all dissolves. Snow is a black sheet and source, silence of language, a quiver with me. For whatever reason, I 
I read two ship poems. A ship of, with hoisted sails draws near my shore. I sense it. I feel it and stand in cold sweat. A ship with holy sails that flies no flag. Oh, how I have waited, childlike, in wastes of them. Day declines and darkens. Dead of night. Will it come? Will it not? All passes so imperceptibly. All arrives on the quiet. Light. Light is the ship that ferries through dream lagoons. All your thought and despair that find no place in world. Glance light and stalwart it glides in full sail beneath the Milky Way. Between towering bare cliffs, through the foam of breakers, round headlands, through inlets, through enchanted lagoons and flowering reefs of coral. Light, light is the ship that quickens image and desire in your blood, your thought and despair, and radiant power and peace. Thank you for those astonishing poems. It's such an honor to uh, to read with you. Thank you, and um, thanks to Patrick for that uh, invitation to be here. I wanted to be in Cork this year because uh, it's a city that needs to be unhaunted for me, and I have friends whose poems I wanted to hear. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. And uh, Sarah, thank you for those kind introductions. I always feel like I should add a line that says, uh, um, I grew up in a household of uh, American Irish Catholics in which the men were expected to grow up to become uh, priests or alcoholics. And I always feel like I should uh, add to an introduction. Well, my name is Tom, and I'm not a priest. Um, <laughs> I'll read a few poems, and uh, it's good that this clock is right here. I always tell the clergy when they're about to begin a, a funeral sermon, 20 minutes, you know, and they, they usually err on the side of too many. You know who you are? You itchy, trigger-fingered son of a bitch, always at my elbow with your, rub their noses in it. Give it to them raw. Spare the cutesy metaphor and bullshit. Say what it was you heard or saw without one extra syllable. How some biker with a buzz on doing 80 in a 45 broadsides a Buick, killing the babies buckled in the front seat, leaving the baby's mother with a limp, a lengthy facial scar, a scream stuck in her somewhere, north of her belly, south of her teeth. I know you don't need symmetry or order so that the biker died in pieces. The arm with the tattoo reading, shit happens, thrown a hundred yards from the one with no tomorrow on it doesn't impress you. But here's a little truth you will approve my telling of. The mom is going to leave her husband, fight with her father, curse the priest. She is going to go and live in the city have her face fixed, drink too much, begin to sleep around in search of the one and only one who can tickle that scream out of her. Maybe you'll run into her. Maybe you're the one. Here's another thing 
you will appreciate. I know you'll like this. Listen up. That scream, if you ever hear it, won't rhyme with anything. I was so uh, grateful to be in attendance for Sandra Beasley and Kim Moore's readings last night. Both of them were very powerful readings, and especially I like Kim's um, series of poems for the men that she did not marry. And it uh, reminded me of how uh, perfectly uh, comforting it is to dish up some comeuppance. And um, uh, I wrote this poem years ago after an epic divorce um, from the mother of my children. And uh, uh, it was written before I took corrective measures for the flaws in my personality. And, um, <laughs> but I always knew that when I read it, I felt better. And uh, I announced that uh, as a way of saying I'm not entirely cured, because after hearing Kim's wonderful poems last night, I thought, I'll read that poem, even though I've been counseled against reading it in public. <laughs> and, uh, and I haven't read it in 35 years. Of it, uh, um, and probably won't want to do it now, except that Kim really inspired me. <laughs> For the ex-wife on the occasion of her birthday. I should say in advance, I once wrote a powerfully unflattering poem about a cat that I hated. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, at least one reviewer took it to mean I didn't like cats. It wasn't the feline I disliked. It was that cat in particular I hated. And I say that because um, it's not like it's, it's not like I don't like women. It's just like it was this woman and only for a little while. We've gotten over it. We're pals now, more or less. For the ex-wife on the occasion of her birthday. Let me say outright that I bear you no unusual malice anymore, nor do I wish for you tumors or loose stools, blood in your urine, oozings from any orifice. The list is endless of those ills I do not pray befall you. Night sweats, occasional itching, PMS, fits, starts, ticks, boils, bad vibes, vaginal odors, emotional upheaval or hormonal disorders, green discharges, lumps, growths, nor telltale signs of gray, dry heaves, hiccups, heartbreaks, fallen ovaries, nor cramps, before, during, or after. I pray you only laughter in the face of your mortality and freedom from the ravages of middle age. Bummers, boredom, cellulite, toxic shock and pregnancies, migraines, glandular problems, the growth of facial hair, sagging breasts, bladder infections, menopausal rage, flatulence, or overdoses, Hot flashes or constant nausea, uterine collapse or loss of life or limb or faith in the face of what might seem considerable debilities. Think of your life not as half spent but as half full of possibilities. The arts may be your music, modern dance or hard rock videos, whatever. This is to say I hereby recant all former bitterness and proffer only all the best in the way of happy birthday wishes. I no longer want your mother committed, your friends banished, your donkey lovers taken out and shot or spayed or dragged behind some Chevrolet of doom. I pray you find that space or room or whatever it is you and your shrink have always claimed you'd need to spread your wings and realize your insuperable potential. Godspeed is what I say and good credentials. What with your background in fashions and aerobics, you'd make a fairly bouncy brain surgeon or well-dressed astronaut or disc jockey. The children and I will be watching with interest and wouldn't mind a note from time to time to say you've overcome all obstacles this time, overcome your own half-heartened upbringing, a skimpy wardrobe, your lowly self-esteem, the oppression of women and dismal horoscopes, overcome an overly dependent personality, stretch marks, self-doubt, a bad appendix scar, the best years of your life misspent on wife and mothering, so let us know exactly how you are once you have triumphed after all, poised and ready on the brink of, shall we say, your middle years. Send word when you have gained by luck of the draw the kindness of strangers, or by dint of will itself, if not great fame, then self-sufficiency. 
Really? Now that I've my hard won riddance of you signed and sealed and cooling on the books against your banks and creditors, now that I no longer need endure your whining discontents, your day-long, night-long carping over lost youth, bum luck, spilt milk, what you might have been, or pining not so quietly for a new life in New York with new men, now that I've been more or less officially relieved of all the hapless duties husbanding a woman of your disenchantments came to be, I bid you, no deposits, no returns, but otherwise a very happy birthday. And while this may sound exactly like goodwill, in some important ways it could be worse. The ancients in my family had a way with words and overzealous habits of revenge, whereby the likes of you were turned to birds and made to nest among the mounds of dung that rose up in the wake of cattle herds, grazing their way across those bygone parishes where all that ever came with age was wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm wishing I had read the one about the cat. Uh, um, I have a house that uh, came into my possession by the goodness of Nora Lynch, the bed of heaven to her. And because I was the, uh, that looks very nice. Because I was the first of my family to have come back uh, from America uh, 50 years ago and kept coming back, uh, she decided to leave her house to me, a gift that I've tried to uh, uh, open to other writers and readers. This is called the rentals ledger. Um, and the thing is, you know, I, I tried to make some money on the thing as a rental for the times that I wasn't here, but then I noticed that uh, I was renting to people, you know, they were real gobshites. I mean, I, I didn't really appreciate, they couldn't appreciate what the house meant or what it was to me or what it was to our family or any of that stuff. So then I just started giving it for use among writers. But since writers are, are chronically poor-mouthing, I, I had a, a book made in which they could write a poem or a paragraph or a story or some good excuse for the use of their time there. And uh, this poem is called Rental's Ledger. Des Kenny up in Galway made this book of pages fit for ink and acid-free and sewn into a leather binding he put Lynch Moving west on the cover, look, there's white space left for the likes of you. So if you're a writer, the rent is due. Pay Rita, Rita Roach, coin of the realm for coal and turf fresh, linens, clean towels, the phones on the honor system, pay as you go. But leave this absentee landlord poems, paragraphs. Sentences, phrases well turned out of your own word board and what you've learned, or better still, out of the stillness, what you hear here in these ancient remedial stones where Nora Lynch held forth for 90 years, the last two decades of them on her own. Alone by the fire in the silence, she recited the everyday mysteries of wind and rain and darkness and the light and sang her evening songs and sat up nights full of wonder and reminiscences. If you hear voices here, the voice is hers. She speaks to me still. If she speaks to you, ready your best nib. Write what she tells you to. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's in this one. These are always surprises. I'll move along. Um, these Sin Eater poems uh, I've been writing for, uh, all the time that I've been writing and uh, this little nunnish press in uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts um, asked if they could collect them all up and put them in one book and I said yes uh, that would be just fine with me and then uh, Jesse Landeni and Sam and Press up 
north of me in County Clare, said they'd like to do an Irish version of it, which I was happy to uh, have done. And the sin eater, as most of you know, is someone who, uh, in the form of bread and beer, takes unto himself the sins of the recently departed, sparing them the purgatory due for their perdition. So, um, of course, one of the questions is what happens to the sin eater? Who eats those sins? But people reviled the sin eater because it always meant that there was a corpse on the premises if he showed up. And he also required payment, uh, a thing that uh, they thought was a little too much. So, uh, The last of these po uh, poems is called Recompense Heraclete. <coughs> and it came out of my intention to honor uh, the donkeys that I have in, in West Clare, uh, the breeding pair were Charles and Camilla, named for the lovebirds on the neighboring island. And well, Charles was named for the ears, which seemed to bear some semblance. And then, uh, and Camilla was big in the news shortly after. So, but uh, a paraclete, as you know, is a spirit guide, and. Uh, and his spirit guide, my spirit guide, the sin your spirit guide. I'd say any of you that spend time with jackasses in a field, you'll soon feel uplifted in every possible way. His paraclete was a piebald donkey bequeathed him by a sad-eyed parish priest whose sins he supped away one wit Sunday, some months in advance of your man's demise. Never a shortage of asses, Argyle. God knows... We've all got one of them, at least, which truth seems surplus to requirements. Argyle named the Wee Jack Recompense and got good orderly direction from it. Wherever the one went, so went the other, bearing mighty nature's burdens wordlessly, the brown sign of the cross across their backs. The last was ever seen of them was headed west, a tattered Amalian and his factotum making for the coast road in the cold and gloaming, braying and flailing out gestures of blessing over hedgerow and hay bales, man and beast alike, hovel and out office, dung heap and home, everything in eye and earshot rectified, cats pardoned, curs absolved, tethered cattle loosed, and all of vast creation reconciled in one last spasm of forgiveness. As for the sin eater and recompense, where the road turned toward the sea, they turned with it. I forgot to mention to you that the sin eater, uh, I named him Argyle because it was only the only reliably Scottish thing I knew, the socks. And, and it sounded like our guilt, Argyle. So, uh, and the, the other thing I like about this little collection is that my son, Michael, took all the photographs that accompany these pieces. I'm just looking through them now. And they remind me of the, the project that was sort of a, um, a two-generation project. And uh, my other son, Sean, uh, was the model for this uh, a corpse's chest with the soda bread and the bowl of beer, which he uh, uh, drew. Uh, we were talking, Doris and me, about dogs and uh, how I'm anxious to get home to, um, to um, see my dog, Carl, who's a, a new replacement for an old dog um, whose name was Bill, um, Bill W. to be exact. And um, uh, I used to every so often say to my wife, do you think we should get a dog? And she'd say, are you fucking nuts? I mean, if life is perfect now. We go where we want to go. We don't have, the kids are gone. Everything's okay. No, no, we don't need a dog. And then, as was my habit, I was often stealing sonnets from Wordsworth. You, you, some of you will remember that sonnet of his, in praise of sonnets, I believe. Uh, Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow rooms. You know this one. And uh, uh, 
So I wrote one called Corpses Do Not Threat Their Coffin Boards. And it was a knockoff, but it, you know, it had 14 lines. So um, I was proud of it. And uh, my habit was in those days, uh, I'd put the, the draft of a poem on the refrigerator. That's before they were all stainless steel, so that you could put a magnet next to them and hold it there. And uh, m my beloved would sometimes, in the duties of the day, see fit to make little corrections in the text. I, these endearments I've never gotten over. I, they took my breath away when I'd see punctuation fixed or the word come. So, and um, so I put uh, my sonnet stolen from Wordsworth up there. And uh, that same Sunday, I remember saying to her, do you think we should get a dog? And she'd say, well, you could call him Wordsworth. Because <laughs> I had put on a poem after Wordsworth. I, I mean, I cite my larcenies. And uh, the, uh, uh, I took that as a permission. So I went to the internet, found the dog I wanted. By Tuesday, I had it. It was 11 pounds of a beautiful dog. He soon grew to weigh more than my wife. And uh, uh, when I got home with him, he was 11 pounds, and she said, what about no, didn't you understand? And I, and, and I said, well, you, you said I could name him Wordsworth. She said, well, just call him Bill W., uh, who was one of the founders of a, a, a self-help program that well, I, I try to keep going to meetings for. And uh, anyway, uh, the life expectancy of the dog I had looked this up in Wikipedia, was six to eight years, which I thought, well, good, I'll, I'll live six to eight years. I'll take care of this. So, uh, And then he lived to be nine years, and I thought, oh, well, it's, 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 it's the good food and the constant love. And then I, I, I moved up north with the dog, enthusiastically uh, supported it by my wife in this decision. And um, uh, she had to stay downstate to take care of aging parents and and I think she thought the dog and I would be happier together. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I can tell you that Bill is the only mammal of that size that has been able to bide with me ever since. And then he died last April, a year of griefs and bereavements that I, I hope never to repeat. And, and um, anyway, I was living up there in 2016 when my friend Matthew Sweeney uh, was commissioned to come over in October of 2016 to do some work with the Harbor Springs Festival of the Book. And he stayed with me. I was nearby at the lake house up north with Bill the dog. And Matthew had three weeks before his next appointment in Ottawa to read it. So, so he stayed with me. And we had a wonderful time. He's a great, he was a great foodie. It's hard still to speak of him in the past tense, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, he'd be up all night. I usually fell asleep about this time, actually. And and, uh, and I think I'll finish with uh, these two poems. Um, he'd stay up all night drinking wine and writing poems. And one of the things he was most fascinated by was something I had constructed out of the uh, soup bones that my dog would uh, hollow out as a form of meditation. I would give him a soup bone and he'd walk out under the maple tree in all weathers and lay down and get the marrow out of the middle and then just leave it there. And I remember one spring picking up after and I found I think 200 of these soup bones scattered around the premises. So, And they were all perfectly bleached by the weather and all hollow and uh, I suppose the Irish in some ways have a higher aptitude for bones than other people do. The whole country seems an ossuarium but um, <laughs> so I just I thought I know I'll have a, a, a need for these so I got a piece of rope and started stringing them on the rope yeah. and I had uh, by, and he kept, of course he kept doing this day after day after day so after a while I had like 10 yards or 20 yards of rope, uh, and I called it the bone rosary, because, you know, it, it, it felt like it had decades, and um, it felt holy in a way, and I thought I'd hang it from a pole out over the lake as a way to uh, mark his eventual grave. I had, this was northern Michigan, 
And I had, when he hit uh, 11, I dug his grave one November because I figured I'd get caught in the middle of winter in a deep frost, and I'd have a dead dog and no hole to put him in, and a corpse rotting, you know, the size of a, a small human. And, um, and Matthew thought I was crazy for having this hole dug for the dog in advance of his death. I explained the, the frost problem. He said, oh, okay. He always thought I lived in a weird zone, but wasn't weird enough. And this was like a, a kind of uh, credential. Uh, so I think that's the reason why. I just wanted to, to have it as a kind of a safeguard against people. They'd see that thing hanging, and I, I did put Christmas lights on it eventually. And it would blink at me. And uh, I, I, I envisioned people going by and saying, that's one weird guy. We're not going to mess with those those. Uh, this is Matthew's poem, The Bone Rosary. The big dog's grave is already dug a few yards from the lake, and all the bones he's sucked the marrow from are strung on a rope draped over the porch railing. A bone rosary, waiting to be hooked to a rusty chain, hung from a metal post, stuck in the ground, poking out over the water. I can already imagine the reactions of people in boats who will pass what they'll think of the resident of the house. There might be more to tickle their fancy. I have a BB gun and ball bearings in a cupboard that will kill as many black squirrels as I wanted. And I might just commission a black totem pole, and although there is no record of anyone walking on the waters of Mullet Lake, I think I may visit a hypnotist in Harbor Springs to see if she can facilitate this. I'd love to run out into the middle of the lake, carrying the stars and stripes, and make all the folks in boats I meet faint and fall into the water, maybe to drown there and befriend the big dog's ghost. <laughs> For reasons I'll never quite understand, I began to associate the dog's uh, tightening anecdotage with what was going on with Matthew. And... Uh, we never sort of really judged that right. All of us, I, speaking for myself now, I was a day late and a dollar short to the realization of how fast he would be removed from us. Anyway, um, the dog died when he was 13. And uh, first his hips gave out, then his shoulders. And I had this little yoke that made him into like a kind of carry-on luggage. I could lift him up in the hindquarters and then he'd reposition himself and flop again for the next eight hours or so. Then one morning on the duty, at the duties of his toilet, he fell face first into a puddle, signaling that his shoulders were gone now. And that was the day he died. Now I get uh, stones and bronze plaques wholesale. And so, and I had always been in love with this poem by X.J. Kennedy, who was the mentor of one of the poets at our conference, a poem called Little Elegy that begins, it's for a, a girl who died skipping rope. Uh, what is it? Here lies resting out of breath, out of turns, Elizabeth. That rhyme always tore at my eyeballs. So I stole that rhyme, or I stole that form, to write and cast in bronze at wholesale. Actually, at free, I made my son pay the bill. Here lies loyal, trusted, true, friend for life, Bill W. Name for Wordsworth and the guy by whose twelve steps I have stayed dry, sober even these long years, like the good dog buried here. Who could bark but never bit, never strayed too far or shit indoors, never fell from grace? God, grant him this ground, this grave, out of harm's way, ceaseless rest. Of all good dogs, old Bill was best.
guess the same question to both of you. What 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 have you sort of reached for in terms of authors or life experience to kind of it's hard to nail death. Sorry for that pun, but it's hard to nail death in a poem and I'm just interested in, in what kind of resources you've both reached into to kind of to write about death. I think I'd be especially interested in many Estonian authors or anything like that. I have never even thought of it, but uh, I'm not that morbid, but uh, <laughs> for whatever reason, I, I have always been thinking of death or, or writing about it. and. Uh, um, and there are so many excellent uh, pieces in world literature written about it, so it just comes naturally. I think the uh, I think the real experts on this are neither um, you know here again and gone tomorrow Yanks uh, or Estonians or um, Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, th I, th I think humans learn this. It's coded in our DNA. The Irish, uh, to their credit, have figured out the difference between the idea of the thing and the thing itself. And in my country, and to some extent I think this is a, 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 a sort of a Western push to, uh, to celebrate life in the way that a good laugh is expected to be better than a good cry. But the Irish still keep the corpse at the center of the goings on. And I think that's useful because I think what a good funeral is, and eventually what dealing with death properly is, is that by getting the dead where they need to go is how the living get where they need to be. And so, like, if something happens in Mogin, and I should say, it always happens. I mean, the numbers are convincing on this. They hover right around 100% of us are going to be dead someday. And I hope all of you are into that experience before I am, I'm just saying. And um, because I think all of us, uh, I think quite properly fear the unknown aspect, which is to say every bit of it. So, but the Irish do know if they get the dead guy in the ground or into the fire or into the tree or wherever they're going to, whatever oblivion they're consigning them to, they're doing themselves a favor by doing the lifting and the lodging and the casseroling and the <laughs> laying out and the digging and the, you know, the shoulder and shovel work. Thank you.